Okay, cool. So it's, we're here, but we are actually, uh, it's the three of us, but there's actually a whole bunch of people in the physical world with us while we are here in our metaverse space. So welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for this session. Um, thank you for your patience while we will just quickly making sure that we're comfortable in this space. Thank you for Informa for helping us sort this out and this incredible technical team to... We, ha we had some interesting experiences trying to get the sound to work today. We have a plan A, B, and C. For, uh, so depending on how things go, we might, we might end up back in the physical world with you. But fingers crossed, today we are going to have a conversation with you about Africa's place in the metaverse from a metaverse space. And where we are right now is called... Uh, well, it's Alt Space VR. And it's a, social, it's a social VR platform. There are loads of places where you can be with other people in events, uh, in different worlds. People build the most incredible worlds here, so in that sense it's an open architecture space. But where we are today is in a private space that uh, Sikun Sele created for us, one of the Opmosa team members, so kudos to you. And he's also acting as our camera today. So, here yeah, we are shooting hoops because this is what we're going to be doing and this I guess will also determine who well if we do this quick enough whoever gets the first hoop in will determine who gets to kind of uh, answer the first question so let's see Brian uh, Alex are you up for this <laughs> let's I think uh, hopefully my skills in the in the orb environment are better than in real life uh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's see. <laughs> oh, wow. Going to put Run for the girl. Oh, wow. Yeah. I feel like Brian's Run been training. <laughs> that was the girl. That was me. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, that was uh, Lou. That was Lou. Ah, that's two for two, James. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Okay, we might be here for a while. So I think let me start with the, let me start with the conversation anyway. So today we have with us, um, we've got Alex Masu, or Masu Alex Masu, with us from Meta. And Alex looks after um, networks and infrastructure f on behalf of, of Meta. And I think has some very, very interesting perspectives to share with us. And then Brian Afande, over here, and you oddly look like you've got a very beautiful ba ba basketball hat, which is really awesome. Um, you, you are with Black Rhino VR, <laughs> and, and Brian, where are you, if you're, what is your physical location right now? Uh, I'm actually in my office in, uh, in a place called Westlands in Nairobi. I'm seated in my office in Nairobi right now. Wow, but you see, you are right here. And, and then there's a very interesting experience I have when I'm in Nairobi with Brian, which is like everywhere I walk with Brian, he knows everybody. It's a, very disconcerting experience. It's actually pretty awesome. <laughs> but it seems that that experience actually translates into, into the virtual world as well. Because yesterday, when you and Alex met, I, I, like you had kind of eyed each other virtually for two minutes and you started speaking in a completely different language. Alex, what was that about? Like, how did the two of you connect <laughs> in this world? So, so uh, <laughs> even, even though I've grown up in South Africa, it's, it's quite ironic. So my, I'm natively from Kenya and uh, you know, turns out Brian is, you know, went to school very close to sort of where my mother's village is. So we were speaking in my mother tongue. Yeah. Exactly. If there's more to it, Brian. Like, <laughs> there's like a school connection. Like, I don't know you for short answers, my friend. There, there, there is because I was really happy. By the time I was looking at Alex's profile, I, w I wouldn't have guessed that he's um, from the Kamba, Eastern Kenya. And for him to start speaking in that language, I was like, man, it just reminded me of my high school days. And immediately there was this connection. That's pretty awesome. So I love it. I absolutely love it. There's a fascinating thing that happens in East Africa in terms of energy, uh, imagination, drive, and then this ability to do fascinating things from a technology point of view. I'm delighted to be in the company of you both today. And my very, very first question. Oh, well done. That was a, that, so the first question comes to you, Brian. So, uh, but actually it is close <laughs> to you both. And it is this. Please share with us your imagination about the metaverse in on this beautiful continent of <laughs> ours where do you think it is what do, what do you think it'll be if we think about the year 2030 or maybe 2032 
help help us see what you see in terms of how the metaverse would have evolved, what it what would have how it would have been shaped here on this continent. Well, uh, Lou, you know when we talk about in the next ten years, let's say 2030-2032, and looking at how um, you know technology is very dynamic and growing exponentially. I'm really excited to see that the metaverse will allow Africans uh, to bring information into spatial context. And I mean all types of information into spatial context. And the novelty of 3D has the power to actually enhance things as data visualization, as it invites people to become more immersed into their work, into their surroundings, into information. So imagine how, what synthetic information and synthetic data would look like and visualizations. I see Africans, I'm also excited that the metaverse will present the opportunity for us as Africans to, uh, to express ourselves beyond gender, you know, um, um, representation and social conventions. I see there's a lot of people in Africa who have been uh, historically been marginalized and, you know, live in a way that they have, uh, been, uh, there are certain biases. I feel like the metaverse will provide for us um, socially inclusive digital communities. There are a lot of people living, living with disabilities can reimagine, a lot of people who are gender, um, neurodivergent, who are not neurotypical, and actually be able to express themselves in the metaverse. And this really excites me. And of course, looking at enterprise solutions where brands and individuals will try to create their own different identities Oh, I love it. Absolutely love I'm, it. I'm in love with that fact. I love the vision that you have of a, of a, of a true, so, true inclusive space um, and all the possibilities that that present, right? I think it's phenomenal. So that, that really much could be the reality of Africa, a physical, a physical world and just kind of a, a, a blink and a lens or a lens away, um, a completely different way of connecting into the universe, I suppose. But for you, Alex, what, is, what does it mean? What if you, you work on making it real every day, right? And if you have to sit back and think about the year 2030, 2032 and this continent, what do you see? What's different? What has changed? I, I think for me, you know, I, I, I think to take a bit of a step back, obviously, you know, it's, it's very early days in terms of uh, how, we're, how we're developing it. And um, 2030 will be very... It's a very good milestone in terms of like where will we be. Now, the the, the two use cases that I think for me that are very uh, it, that come to heart is is really education and sort of cultural. You know how how we how we introduce it is from a cultural perspective, right? Now, from an education point of view, you know, obviously, with the immersive experience that you then start. Uh, sorry, there's a bit of an echo. It's just uh, <laughs> running through. So so. You guys getting the echo as well? That's good. You're good to go. Okay, cool. So, so from from my perspective, from an education perspective, you've got the situation now where um, you know you have much more scalable immersive education experiences, not just at a um, not just at a tertiary level, but even at a basic education level. When you think of you know you know provided you sort of have the infrastructure supported, when you think of extreme rural areas and you know quality of education in those areas, you start now saying to yourself, okay, cool. When I look at sort of sort of dematerialized, uh, you know, uh, education spaces and, you know, access to good educators, access to good uh, sort of um, tooling and, and, and things of the such. It, it really, bec you, you start to think of like the continental sort of uh, human capital sort of uh, delta that comes through from that. The other one really is practical training. So, you know, thinking like an engineer, you know, that I used to be quite a while back, you know, if you have to dismantle an engine, right, uh, and you're sitting in the middle of, uh, Kinshasa, Congo, right? It doesn't mean that you actually have to physically own, you know, a diesel engine, right? So it means you can actually have a, you know, a, a physically 3D engine in front of you that you can practice on, that you can tool in, um, and, and then obviously, you know, then, then train on. So even when you look at then sort of enterprise solutions as well, you know, how people train each other, you know, how people virtualize sort of uh, these like digital twins, I think that's where really the big, the big vision for me would be. Like you know, having this very um, continuous sort of, you know, um, good access to education, good access to training, I think that's where it's really going to be important. 
I think when I think of then about like uh, culturally how it's going to be interesting, I think all of us are part of some sort of family WhatsApp group, and that's transformed sort of the way we interact with each other as a as a you know as a community, right, uh, and as a group of people as Africans, right, particularly those who are in the diaspora or those who are sort of sitting you know in Africa itself. Now, when when I start thinking about okay, um, you know, add presence to that, how will we start you know interacting with each other from a cultural perspective? Uh, you know, in, in 10 years' time. That becomes a very, very interesting concept. Maybe, you know, you know maybe you'll have a lobola sort of happening, <laughs> you know, in the middle of, you know, in the middle of a virtualized space. And that could, you know, be very, <laughs> could create very interesting dynamics, right? Like, so, you know, whereas before you sort of uh, being, t you know, you're, you're sort of learning about what's happening at home through sort of, um, you know, the WhatsApp and, you know, videos and photographs, you now can be very present in some of these interactions. So I think for me, it's, you know, the, the use cases will be developed by Africans. And it's going to be interesting how we, we take it forward. That for me is like personally why I think the, my vision would, would sort of isolate it to sort of two cases where it could be, yeah. <laughs> I love it so much. But do you think Africans will accept virtual reality uh, cattle? as part of the liberal. <laughs> <laughs> They'll accept Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Perhaps the NFTs. Perhaps the NFTs. Yes. Back <laughs> by. It's There's a way. Like, it's like cattle that grows. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's something here. Okay, we, we're thinking of... Okay, I think exactly. we have to talk... We have to have a the business... There's a business conversation happening after this. Okay. I love it. Very much. I think... What you also touched on, which I think is usually encouraging, is the business side of things, right? Um, the ability to, for example, create prototypes in virtual reality that um, one, can sh one can A, collaborate around with teams that sit literally around the world, uh, so it leverages your talent wherever you are. And those prototypes don't degrade. You know, they don't degrade from being shipped from one place to another. Um, and then with that, the training element, the fact that you can, <laughs> these virtualized uh, machines, uh, whatever the models are, 3D elements are, are there for people to, to learn with, to develop, to refine. BMW, I think, talked about how including virtual reality and augmented reality have reduced their design cycles to by a year. And if you, th if you link that to a commercial case, that becomes very significant. Um, and it does mean that talent that sits anywhere on our continent becomes easily becomes included in, in, in that, as so many of us are part of, of multinational organizations in one way, shape, or another. Right, James, are you ready for the next question and the next place? Are you ready for the next question and the next place? Yes, Are you are. coming over? Let's yeah, go. Yeah. Sure, so we're going over to this stage this. over here. Let's go over here. There we go. This is the space for our next, for our next conversation. Thank you very much. Siku, our camera will be following us. There you go. There you go. And of course, before we do anything else, we absolutely have to. Yes, there we go, there we go. That. And just welcome everybody. This is our, our, mini, our mini Meta Fireworks show. But don't worry, it's, um, it's been approved by the venue. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, so the next question, the next question for you both is this, and, and Alex, for fairness sake, I'll start with you this time. Um, it's about enablement. So we've, we've mapped out a bit of a vision for how things could be, could shape, could change. There's a model for inclusion that I think you've constellated powerfully that I think applies in the ways that, that you position it culturally and commercially or from a business perspective, Alex. Now, if we have that vision and we hold that vision, then my next question really is about um, how do we make it happen? Uh, how do we enable it? You know, what is it that we need to put in place from a resource perspective, from a human perspective, f even potentially from a policy perspective? What is the next step? Uh, and Alex, before you speak, I just want to help you quickly with that echo. So I'm going to come over to you. Don't worry, I'm right here. I'm just going to reduce your volume a little bit. Let's see if that helps. Okay, over to you, Alex. Sure thing. So I think for me, um, oh, this is fantastic. Yeah, no echo, right? I think for me, the 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 big the big um, you know, there are sort of four main things, and, you know, I could be, I could be wrong, you know, it will sort of, uh, you know, sort of evolve in time. The four main ones are really, you know, ecosystem development, um, you know, just obviously having the participants, you know, sort of develop assets and develop worlds to sort of participate in it and use cases. The, the, the next one is really, you know, device enablement, right? So, I mean, yeah, so the same way, you know, mobile phones went through the sort of, uh, 
age of, you know, in, like were completely inaccessible and completely expensive at one point to sort of getting to a point where you now have a microcomputer sitting in your pocket uh, at a relatively low cost. And in some places, you can even get them, you know, a smartphone for up to $35. So that's really come down. So I think they, there's definitely a, uh, a ramp uh, to sort of get us to a point where these things are sort of, uh, you know, internationally sort of uh, much cheaper. Then the, the next one really that's really important for me is, um, is infrastructure enablement. So there's, a, there's really a big gap right now, even from an internet perspective, like just getting African people from a critical mass you know, onto the internet, right? Even though a lot of us are on right now, uh, there's still a big gap in terms of just basic internet. Virtualized experiences you know, creates a, a bit of a technical problem that hasn't really been faced before. So now if you think of, you know, if the three of us are sort of sitting here in this orb space, you know, it's, it's one thing about, you know, uh, when you think about, uh, you know, what the infrastructure needs to be behind this, it's going to be interesting. Um, but scale it up to a billion people, uh, an immersive experience requires latency of, let's say, 40 milliseconds. A WhatsApp call is 250. Now, you know, fiber cabling and all that sort of stuff has a physical limitation in terms of, you know, how long distance this stuff can be before your milliseconds start to increase, right? So I think that's something we're going to have to figure out, I think, in conjunction sort of with the... Um, you know, with the different partners in the market. Uh, what you might see is actually, you know, a lot of data now sort of routes through, you know, to data centers in Europe, America. You're going to have to see a lot more of processing and AI happening at the edge, so uh, in a much more micro scale. So obviously us being a lot closer uh, from an infrastructure perspective to the user. So, you know, to give an example, maybe you'll have, you know, a micro data center sitting in, you know, Ronda Bosch, one here in sort of C point, and, and that's how we'll process. Because if you look at these devices that we have, they obviously can't do a lot of processing in the device itself. It has to happen somewhere. And the closer you make that to sort of the user, the better experience. And I think that's what the enablement we require will need. And I think there'll be a lot of um, you know, technological advancements in order to sort of get us there, because right now the architecture is, you know, is a bit latent, and we obviously have to get people just onto the basic internet itself, right? But I think that's where uh, the, 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 the push is really going to be to get this, to get this thing at scale. Thank you so much. Uh, there we go. There we go. Just props for you. Props for you. And I but please throw us. Question, question, I please qu throw us pan in the wax, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do have a follow-on question quickly for you, uh, Alex. Before I, we come to you, Brian, and it's this, and I'm stealing from a previous session. Okay. It's uh, how f how feasible is it? These are these microgrid solutions or smaller grid solutions for environments that are more rural or that has less density. Um, and what does that mean for penetration on our continent? And what about satellites, to ask that question? <laughs> yeah, sure, I can, I can actually answer both of those. So I think from, from, from where we are right now, like um, if I think about, you know, you know, you've got the Taracos who are building these big sort of data centers and we, we go put our machines in there, then we process the information from, from, from WhatsApp or from Instagram and, you know, and get it all over the world. So what we're going to start thinking about, particularly with some of our projects in Africa, we're looking at innovating around sort of these um, much more cost-effective repeater sites, right? So technically a repeater site is something that just boosts your sort of fiber signal. But what we were actually thinking about is actually, uh, why can't we use some of these for, you know, putting actual equipment? And then, you know, there's also the, the, the th you know, we could also partner with MNOs as well, looking at, you know, how proliferated their base stations are, right? Why can't we make these smaller sort of peering sites, right? Then when you get a lot more rural, then you have to get, be a lot more creative. You really have to start having these really, really low cost solutions that uh, either the base and either the, either at the, the base station site or uh, we have to invent a new sort of site that will then be a lot closer to the users, right? So that's the one. In terms of satellite, satellite can definitely give you the throughput in terms of the megabits, but the gap you've got there is the latency because you've got to shoot the signal up to space and then come back down. You know, you, you, it's, it, you know the latency is always going to be the issue. So you'll have very laggy experiences. Uh, you know, those who game will understand that, right? You'll have very laggy experiences <laughs> in terms of these very uh, immersive uh, sort of environments. So that could be a challenge in the long run, I think, yeah. Awesome. yeah. But I think to give people just basic connectivity, satellite is great, yeah. Can we not just optimize the EV recharging stations that people are going to be building everywhere? Yeah, you can, okay. you can, if you can get that, that's a good source of power. If you can build a sort of a low-cost facility near there, then you've got, you've got a good uh, peering site, yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Uh, we'll talk business afterwards. <laughs> so, uh, but Brian, coming over to you, I'm really interesting. I'm, I'm really interested to know what lenses you look uh, through when you think about enablement, and and how you see that particular question. Sorry. Guys. <laughs> that, uh, was, that was just to open your session. <laughs> yes. um, I think. 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> to be honest, uh, I think the size ship. Sorry, Brian. I think you're. The is really. Can you guys hear me? You're breaking up a bit on our end. So Luke, can you guys hear me? Sort of, you're breaking up a bit on our end. Can you hear me, Brian? Yeah, I can hear you. I can awesome. hear you. So once two Africa has landed, um, this will not happen. Huh? Oh. <laughs> I, I, Thank you. Still, no, we still have connectivity issues. But I was talking about the seismic shift and where this seismic shift will come from. I think the seismic shift will really come from the educational sector. And currently, we should really try to start lobbying for educational reforms and bridging the knowledge gap is increasingly important for us as Africans so that the skills being acquired in institutions of higher learning to build the skills of the metaverse really should be informed from the market. Uh, creating content for 3D immersive environments is hard. We all know that, right? But if it's technically to do that, I think there is an uh, for people, young people, to be able to create these assets without going through a crazy learning curve. And the idea would be that it's going to be easy for us to create this if both the consumption of it has more or less some form of parity. Because it all, all only has to come from the educational sector. And once these institutions of higher learning can actually start adopting 20th century skill sets, then we look at a situation where the metaverse is not, the Africans are not only uh, participating as consumers of the metaverse, but as producers of the metaverse, coming up with different value chains within the metaverse, looking at the metaverse and the circular economy within the metaverse. What does it mean for us as Africans? So the biggest, for me, the biggest seismic shift will really have to come from the educational sector. And perhaps that educational sector, even the definition there of broadens, because there are so many opportunities. It's so interesting for me. I mean, I, I've learned so much about virtual reality in virtual reality. Uh, on the same platform, Altspace VR, there is a community called Educators in VR. Um, and what they share freely and abundantly uh, has, has, created, has created intelligence for me. So I'm wondering, uh, as, we, as, are the, as we, how we as the Africans uh, who build the metaverses also do the, you know, bring the skills with it. And I know this is something that you're involved in. Don't you want to share a little bit about that? So how you are, in fact, part of that process of creating the skills that is creating the metaverse or creating the metaverses? Yeah, definitely, Lou. A, a lot of the work that we do is really, our business model is quite So, sorry, Brian, it's Commercial. breaking up a bit. Sorry, and do, then do you mind? 40% is what we call ecosystem building. Sorry, Brian, do you mind just repeating that again? Uh, it just broke up a bit. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Okay, Lou, can, can you guys hear me? We're battling a little bit. Brian, can you, can you see if you can adjust on your side? And then in the meantime, we're going to go to the Orb Mercive Lounge over there, and we'll catch up, we'll catch up with you, and we'll come okay. back to this question. All right. Thank you very much. Bye, Alex. Where are you going? No, Alex, not that direction. We're going to the immersive round. It's this direction. Okay. There sorry. we go. I will try and point the way. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's come through. Okay. Thank you. So we'll wait and try and get Brian back with us and hopefully with a really cool connection. Um, if you come over here, there's some beanbags for you to play with. Oh, wow. I don't want you to be bored. So this is our house, you know. This is how we do it. This is how we flow. And if you would like some popcorn, we've got some, uh, we've got some for you over there. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. So the last, the last point of conversation really is, so from vision to enablement to impact, right? So we, we started, we talked a little bit about impact right at the very beginning. But I'm wondering if you have, if you have more thoughts, Alex, on on impact. So we create this vision for Metaverse. We talk about um, virtual reality, extended realities. We talk about these actually also in relation to allied skills such as Web3 technologies. What is the impact? What is the impact that we will have created um, through 
creating these spaces, building these skill spaces, creating the infrastructure that you're talking about, what does actually physically change in somebody's day-to-day -day life? Work, life, play, um, business, what changes? Yeah, sure. So, so for this one, it's interesting. So, you know, when I, when I think about, uh, you know, um, sort of the Web 3.0 situation, I always try to think about what, what changed in 2.0, right? So, you know, the, the one, the one um, you know, when I think about 2.0 and I think about how money transfers completely revolutionized as a result of sort of, you know, people having mobile phones and being able to transfer them, and that was predominantly an African innovation, I start thinking about, okay, what happens when we start to dematerialize assets, right? So, you know, for example, if you, if you run a trading business, you know, like, uh, you know, a stock trading business or whatever, you know, you're now in a situation where instead of having, you know, a business where you have, um, you know, 10 TV, no, 10 screens and a, a really expensive sort of computer in front of you that needs to run it, you can now have a dematerialized asset base where you can then do it in a virtualized space, uh, particularly when it comes to knowledge work, right? Uh, I, I'm really interested when that retooling starts changing, right, and people start saying, oh, look, let's collapse the office, right, into a virtualized space. Let's collapse, you know, computers into a virtualized machine. Um, you know, the OPEX savings that comes from that, the enablement that comes from that, that for me is going to be incredibly impactful because, you know, you now, you now are, you know, talking to people in sort of a universally translated way, uh, and you've got these dematerialized assets that sort of sit in a virtualized space that you can use at any time, and you can probably, you know, there'll probably be a least sort of, uh, you know, method of doing it. I, I think it really, really enables the economy, uh, you know, in a really, really big way, right? So, you know, where you are uh, starts to matter a little less, right? And I think that for me is the big impact from, for, from an African point of view. It's the unlocking of human capital uh, where it sits today, right? So that, that for me is what uh, the big impact really is going to be. And, and I'm really interested to see what the use cases people come up with, particularly when you start dematerializing digital assets. I, I'm really keen for that, yeah. I find that absolutely fascinating, and I think the one thing that we are truly remarkable at as a, as a continent and wherever I go is this ability to, to create new use cases that really, or, or find the use cases that really allow us to deploy these technologies in fascinating ways, um, and to do it in a way that's really practical for people. So I think that is phenomenally exciting. So how do we create a pipeline to bring people on board to create this whole constellated set of possibilities and opportunities and technologies and access with all the challenges that we're solving for in creative ways on this continent? I guess that for me would be something that this conversation leaves me with. Brian, are you back? I'm back like I never left. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, my friend. <laughs> You're welcome to please pick up if you want to on that conversation uh, we had outside about enablement. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then please rock it through and into this conversation around impact. Okay. So my apologies for my connectivity issues. Still, as we can imagine, um, accessibility is really one of the biggest challenges. Um, but be that as it may, I think in, in terms of trying to find, um, trying to empower next generation of innovators and inventors around step of the work is highly commercial work. And then the 40% is what we call ecosystem building. Uh, one of the disparities that exist in Africa is the role of women in technology. Because abilities from the ground up. One of the things that we wanted to do is to empower women within the VR space and the XR space. So we have a program that actually empowers videos, special to be able to create stories around, you know, as Africans, story is at the core of our being. We learn a lot of things through story, right? So we decided to start empowering women through a story. The second project is actually an exhibition going on right now. It's a month long exhibition and it's a project called State of the Art, which really empowers artists with, um, with extended reality technology. And this project is right at the, at, the, at the cornerstone and the apex of creativity and technology where we see it as a, as, a, as a repository for memories in a society. 
and we have to start creating these digital memories, the synthetic data that we are talking about. So our program actually empowers artists to be able to create their own immersive artwork and looking at the metaverse and looking at digital art as an infinite canvas. How can you be able to use an infinite canvas to create dimensions and dimensions of different thought processes and, and, and beautiful artwork? So this is part of the ecosystem building work that we do in terms of creating impact in the society, of course. Oh, love it. It's absolutely brilliant. You are breaking up a little bit from time to time, but I think we are able to follow the gist. Uh, but I think on the women's program that you're running, the key point was that you are equipping them with skills from, from how to create 360 worlds, right? through And, and so I think the same with the artists, to how, to how to include spatial sound and how to create all the different elements that is required to really create an impactful, beautiful, storytelling, immersive experience, uh, which is very powerful. So, so final question then, before I think I ask, closing co ask each of you for a closing comment, I think we should do that back at the base, uh, basketball court, only makes sense. Uh, but my, on, on, the, on the story around impact, Brian, we're talking about impact. What is the, what is the potential? What does, XR, what does XR have? What does the metaverse have for this continent? What will have changed once it becomes a, signific a significant part of life for us? Do man, you know, when I think about such a question, I really think about what it means to us as Africans. Accessibility is Africa in the future of the entire industry in Africa. We, we're losing you a little the bit there, Brian. We'll be able to create that. Sorry? We, we lost you a little bit there. Please try again. I'm saying accessibility is really yes. significant in, 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 it's a significant thing. What costs are they going to access these different worlds and create content around it? More people will be able to create their own work without the need for specialized skills. This will allow us to really widen the commercial scale and application of the XR landscape and the metaverse. So it really boils to accessibility and the need for not to be able to access specialized skill sets. So we are talking about drag and drop technology. We are talking about that can be able to be Thank you. In so for me, at the core of my, uh, at the core of everything is really accessibility. Thank you very much. So really it's about accessibility that unleashes people's talent and makes it possible to create, to create these worlds that we're talking about, um, to interact with them in a way that's really powerful, and to leverage the incredible and boundless seemingly amounts of talent that we have in this continent. Thank you. We are about to close, but before we do, shall we uh, go back to the basketball court for one more round of hoops? Let's see each other there. Sure thing. Thank sure you. Thing. All right, you can play some side bets, audience, if you like. <laughs> We're going to have, uh, I think, let's have three hoops. Let's have three balls each, right? Three balls each, and okay. then top, ladies, top score, top score takes it. All right, okay, I'm not scared of you. Okay, you have to shoot from outside of the, the white line, <laughs> oh, okay, right? Okay, damn. <laughs> ah. Yeah, I'm outside the white line. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Ah. Okay, one out of three. Next. Let me try this. If I get one, that'll be fantastic. Oh, no. Close, close. Whoa. <laughs> Definitely not. Hmm. Hopefully, I'm better at basketball in real life, right? <laughs> 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 Go, Brian. Let's try this. Close. Oops. The girl's going to take it. Oh, it's a tie. Okay, sudden death. Sudden death. No, I will not. I will not. Sudden death. Sudden death. One more. Two more. What's sudden death? Best, first person to... Okay, go. Okay, that didn't work. You? Go. Okay. Oh, oh no. Yes. Yes, yes. 
Can I hear it? Girls, at least from the girls in the house. Can I, can I at least hear it from the girls in the house? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so final comments, final thoughts, final comments. Brian, coming over to you. Where are we going? Where are we taking it? What is the excite? How, how high should our excitement level be around this technology and the possibilities it has for us? Um, I look at XR in general as a gift that, that we have in Africa. And the gift is that the internet has really leveled the playing field in terms of access. And because I stand on the shoulders of other young people in Africa who really believe in this media. I mean, I'm right my own. Oh, Brian. It's very hard to hear. Brian is saying he yeah. resigned from his job to, re to run his own company, and that has been a massive investment time, if it and energy. Exactly. But I look at it as it's an opportunity for us as Africans to really reframe that narrative. And the internet has really uh, leveled the playing field. I didn't go to an XR school to learn this. I graduated from the prestigious school of YouTube Premium. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe a lot of young people can actually learn and earn a living Absolutely. from XR. So it's an opportunity for Africans to really be able to redefine and a metaverse and, and these digital twins that we're talking about and bring our imagination and show the rest of the world that we can really not just build our own solutions, but export our own solutions. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. I think that's a key part of it. Alex, over to you for almost the last word. Yeah, sure. So, so I think for, for me, um, you know, just sort of, there's obviously the ecosystem opportunity, but also, you know, we've, we've got this big obstacle in terms of that we need to lean into as a sort of as a continent and sort of to get us there from an infrastructure perspective. And I think there's a lot of commercial opportunity there, right? So, um, you know, as people sort of think about what to invest in, where to go, there, there is sort of edge technologies. There's, there's a lot of like, you know, connectivity based technologies. I think there's going to be uh, quite a big opportunity uh, from that perspective to get involved and, uh, and also to collaborate with partners as well. So, so, so there, you know, the, the journey to, to sort of this environment, I think is also an interesting one from an infrastructure perspective. And I think it's something that we, we all, you know, could stand to benefit quite a bit. Because I think it would be quite unique and, and great if sort of, you know, in the next 10 years, we've got uh, new sort of infrastructure providers, new fiber providers, new data center providers, uh, and that and that really is going to be the group that's sort of sitting in front of us today, right? Uh, coming up with these ideas and and investing. So it's you know to lean into that tangibly, uh, and obviously to make to make money alongside uh, sort of the ecosystem players as well. Thank you so much. Mm. I think the opportunity is f incredible. I think the core riggers are data, and uh, I think this creative economy of ours, supported by all the infrastructure that so many of the people in the room are putting in place. I think it's been an absolute joy being with you today. Thank you, Meta. Can we hear it for Meta? Can we hear it for Black Rhino VR? Thank you very much. And to Informa. And um, see you wherever we find each other in the Metaverse next. Cheers. Cheers, cheers. See you guys. Cheers, Thank Brian. you so much.